Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Paris Center and this session of The Future Mind. Today, physicist and neurobiologist Christopher Koch will be in conversation with Alex Gomez Morin. Christoph is best known for his work exploring the physical basis of consciousness in humans, animals, and machines. A phys physicist and neurobiologist, he was for more than a quarter of a century a professor of biology and engineering at the California Institute of Technology and the president and chief scientist of the Allen Institute for Brain Science. He is also chief scientist of the Tiny Blue Dot Foundation, seeking to understand consciousness and its place in nature and how this knowledge can benefit all of humanity. Today, he is in conversation with Alex Gomez Marin, a Spanish physicist turned neuroscientist and director of the Paris Center. He is head of the Behavior of Organisms Laboratory in Alicante, where he is an associate professor of the Spanish Research Council. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Alex. Welcome. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Well, today it's really a treat to have Professor Koch with us. Um, as most of you may know by now, he's arguably one of the most, if not the most influential and notorious neuroscientist of consciousness alive. And so we're delighted that he's here with us to discuss about the future mind. And so, well, without further ado, there's so much to cover um, and we can go wherever the wind take us. But I wanted to start by asking you, Christoph, where's consciousness science today? And probably we'll we'll go back to the 90s and also back to the future. But where do you think we are now with science, uh, with the science of consciousness? Thank you, Alex, for having me on. And uh, thank you. I like the ambivalence of notorious. Um, <laughs> where's consciousness science? Well, so when I started, in fact, I am right now today visiting uh, my old uh, university, Caltech. And when I started here to think about consciousness back in 1986, 87, I got involved um, with Francis Crick, who at the time had, had moved from uh, from the MRC in in, uh, in Cambridge, where he'd done his, his groundbreaking work with Jim Watson and, you know, helped the code. Uh, helped decode the genome. He moved to the Salk Institute, and he was also very interested in tackling consciousness. And at the time, so this was mid-80s, it was considered a, certainly a faux pas for a young assistant professor who hadn't yet attained the holy state of tenure, right? I mean, Francis Crick, he's a half-god uh, among um, biologists, and he could do anything he wanted, but a young faculty professor, that was definitely a no-no. But we both felt that it was shocking that the central aspects of our lives, namely my experience of life, that's the only way I know anything exists, right? Uh, shades of René Descartes, is that science couldn't address it or didn't want to address it. And we felt we had to do that. And so we started um, this program, an empirical program, independent of whether you're a uh, materialist or physicalist or a weak epiphenomenalist or you know a dualist or something like that we can all agree as long as you assume there is something to explain um that there will be some footprints in the body in particular in general in the brain in particular and where where are those footprints what are, what are the key neural mechanisms that are involved what's the time scale who has it when does it happen in development you know does the fetus already have it what about a newborn what about in dementia? What about cats and mice and other mammals? What about non-mammalian species? How low does it go? Um, all of those questions. At the time, very few people did this. Um, you know, Jerry Edelman, another um, Nobel laureate, and, and Giulio Cianoni, uh, Bernie Bass, so there were very few people at the time. Now today, fast forward, you know, um, almost you know, 35 plus years, now it seems that almost everyone has sort of a theory of consciousness. I put those in quotes because most of these are not theories, they're really just guesses. You know, I think this is involved, or I think entanglement is involved, or I think, you know, it must be deep layer five that's involved, or the claustrum of this or that. Those are all working hypotheses, those are not theories. So it, it, there's almost concern that the, the, the noise drowns out the signal. On the other hand, there are these large goal collaborations, you know, funded by the Templeton Foundation that try to do this open science, pre-registered science, so the best science practices that are all specifically focused on, on, um, on, on discovering something or trying to prove or disprove some of those theories of consciousness. So there has been lots of advances. And of course, our techniques have gotten so much better, so much more precise in space and time and level of granules. 
granularity over the last 35 years. So I'm, I'm hopeful we will solve this problem sooner or later. What would it mean to solve the problem? Yeah, thank you. Well, so what we can all agree on, so some of you may know I lost a bet against the philosophy of Chalmers last year that I, I, he and I had made a bet at a, at a meeting of the ACC, the Scientific Association for the Study of Consciousness back in Germany in Bremen in 1998, where I said, listen, Dave, now, of course, I was a young assistant professor. I was full of vigor, and you know, I believed in neuroscience. And I said, "Look, in twenty-five years, we will solve this problem." Which, by that, we meant we will identify the neural footprints in the brain, and the field will agree on what those neural footprints are. Okay, so this is an operational problem. This is a purely scientific problem. What are the necessary or jointly sufficient mechanisms in your brain that give rise to hearing my voice? or dreaming about my voice, or you know, remembering my voice uh, tomorrow when you think back about this interview, right? And and this and, and David Chalmers agrees this is not the hard this is not a hard problem. This is a what he would call an easy problem. This is a problem that science can solve. Um, now, uh, you know, fast forward 25 years. Last year, I had to admit publicly at at another ACC meeting at NYU, um, and I gave him six bottles of fine Madeira wine. Uh, uh, because the community had clearly not converged yet on a final NCC. But, you know, it's, it maybe takes another 25 years, maybe takes another 50 years. Again, he and I are in full agreement that this is, a, this is an empirical solvable problem. What's not apparent how quickly it'll be solved is to have a system. So what the NCC would say, it would say, okay, these mechanisms in this part of the brain requiring a, B, and C, maybe even including quantum entanglement. Who knows? These are the uh, these are the conditions in the brain, let's say, of an adult human that can tell us about it. That are that are, uh, I mean, jointly sufficient for having a particular conscious experience. Then, what that means, we can track it. For example, in people um, that have um, that have a severe brain injury that are behavioral unresponsive. There are a million of these patients roughly each year. Well, we don't know whether they're conscious because they're behavioral unresponsive. We can track these footprints back into early childhood. When do they first occur? Is it a newborn? Is it the third term trimester? Is it earlier? We can track those footprints in other mammals, in mice and cats and dogs and, and non-human primates, etc. We can then see whether we can generalize them to, to, to other animals. So it would give us a big foothold onto the, onto the mind-body problem and would lead to Nobel Prizes, etc. What it would not do, it would not give, it would not necessarily, although it might help, but it, it is not a theory of consciousness. A theory of consciousness is something where you start from very general, as general as possible, first principle, and explain why a particular piece of matter, like this one here, highly excitable matter, like this one here, but not this one here, not my heart or my kidney or my liver, because those are also biological matter, but for reasons we don't fully understand, they're not conscious. Why particular pieces of active matter come hand in hand with conscious with consciousness? How consciousness fits in into the general scheme of nature? You know, what sort of stuff is it? Is it physical? Is it mental? If it's mental, how is it different from the physical? Um, and that, that we can then also use to extrapolate, to engineer it, uh, um, uh, um, to engineer artifacts like cerebral organoids and like large language models, right? To infer on the basis of a universally accepted theory, they are conscious or they are not conscious. And it's not clear to me of necessity that we will get to that stage. I think we have an excellent candidate, integrated information theory. But again, th uh, that, of course, is also still controversial. That's so interesting because you see, I, I perceive kind of a, a sweet contradiction here because on the one hand, we need more progress and we promise more progress. And we've, when I say we, I mean, of course, the field has made incredible progress. Lots to know and lots that is known. And that should be the way. And at the same time, there's this kind of kernel of, well, even if we did all of that, we would still miss the, the deepest point. Maybe, maybe. Let's not be defeatist about it. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. We don't know until we get there. Don't ever believe philosophers when they pronounce, we shall never know. 
because philosophers have done this before and they were wrong. You know, we shall never know what other stars are made out of famously, right? And of course we know, we know what, what stars are made out of. So you let's see, just give it a try. I know for certain if we don't try, we'll never find it. Totally. And, and there's a scientist in me, but there's a philosopher. And I'm most, more concerned about scientists behaving as covert philosophers than as philosophers saying we won't understand. <laughs> You, you know what I mean in general, right? Because in the 90s, you made this strategic, clever move. Maybe a little bit, you could say, like Galileo saying, well, let's just make empirical progress in one sense. But lately, as I understand you and others, we are realizing that, well, the philosophical frameworks really matter to be able to make real progress in, in this problem, right? So I would say it's, it's even more dangerous when we scientists just say, well, Let's just talk about the data because we are underneath sneaking a, a philosophy. And that also needs to be exposed in the good sense, bring to bring it to light and examine it. Totally agree. Yes. So what are those isms? Um, of course, um, many of the field started being materialistic, but now there are other isms on the table. And we should not be too concerned about the particular isms of each philosophical take, but they clearly make a difference. I mean, panpsychism is now, at least you're able to say it, but you still get a lot of anger. One could even say anger against sounding a little bit panpsychist. The idea that, well, minds may be extended beyond, beyond the brain and the nature, not just the whole of nature, but at least a great deal of nature may be ensouled or in minded, right? How comfortable are you with those, with those ideas? Oh, I'm very comfortable talking about panpsychism. I'm very comfortable talking about idealism. So let's just step back. Materialism, you know, now known as physicalism, and people think it's triumphant. But of course, if you look closely, we have no frigging idea how to define the physical. Like we just gave out a Nobel prizes two years ago, and Nobel prize we can sort of consider an operational measure of what scientists think is true that tells us that particles can be almost infinite far away and they're entangled and you, they don't really, you know, until you observe them, you can't really clearly say in what state they are. Well, that's hardly the objective, uh, you know, clockwork universe that, you know, materialist envisioned in the, um, in the 19th century, right? So it becomes, and then a lot of physicists claim that ultimately space and time doesn't really have any reality, right? So we don't really know where, what the physical is. So I think it's really important not to be sort of naive physical is and look at other ways of of uh, 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 other ways to conceive of the the uh, the metaphysics of of ontology of what exists so you know the the sort of at least western philosophy and that's the only one i'm really familiar with revolves around the two poles of physicalism and and sort of well the physical and the mental right so physical physicalists and most scientists, as you said, and most philosophers, particularly most analytical philosophers, are so sort of physicalists. This is the only thing that exists. So consciousness either is just waved apart, doesn't really exist, or you're confused about it, or it's an illusion, or it can just be safely eliminated. Well, that hasn't gotten really very far. Right? This project, this fond hope, hasn't really <laughs> realized at all because we're still left with a fundamental mystery of why we're conscious. Okay, then there's idealism, which is now beginning to resurface, which in a sense is even is also is very elegant because it says, well, no, ultimately the only thing that exists is the only thing I have direct acquaintance with. The only thing I have direct acquaintance with are subjective states, phenomenal states, right? I hear, I see, even if I'm a physicist, I have to be able to see to look at a voltmeter in order to read to 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 read the gauge, right? So Idealism just says, well, ultimately, it's all the way past the horizon of what, what I see. Everything is mental. And even the physical, the external world, ultimately, is a representation of something mental. Right? This goes back to Schopenhauer and then now modern philosophers like Bernardo Castro and others who argue for it. Or you can say, well, I'm a panpsychist when I say, well, these two separate things are really au fond at the rock bottom, they're really linked. They're not the same. They're intimately linked. So even, you know, elementary particles, super strings or, you know, atoms or whatever you think they are, have both physical and mental aspects. What I don't like about that, panpsychism doesn't explain why these glasses, okay, why they aren't conscious. Because if everything is conscious, all particles are conscious. Well, clearly these glasses are conscious. I have no idea what that means. I have no idea what that means. 
So each of these positions has strengths and weaknesses. And so we need to get a little bit away from these isms and look at actual scientific theories that have a particular foundation, like integrated information theory, but that they're not necessarily easily slotted into one. You know, people like to slot the are you a physicalist or are you a panpsychist or Cartesian dualist or something? Well, a theory is a theory and it makes a particular IT very clear statement about what exists and then you can map it on whatever way of conceiving of the metaphysics of what exists as you want to. Yes, yes. I mean, the nice thing is that there's not only one game in town anymore, the game of physicalism, there are more options. Now, let me ask you, and this would take hours to unfold, right? But what, what do you my, think? By, by the way, my Google just claims I switched into German on account of my heavy accent. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> never had that happen. <laughs> let, let me ask you then a simple question. What's that special? What's special about the brain? You were saying, well, other pieces of matter don't seem to be able to make it, but the brain can. What the do most... you think? And yeah. It's the most complex piece of highly organized matter in the known universe. You know, it seems to be vastly more complex than my liver or my heart, or certainly as my glasses. Um, and so now you need to specify what you need. You know, complexity is notoriously difficult to define. But, but on the face of it, it's highly active. Uh, and it's very, 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 very complex. You know, we now know based on the efforts of the Allen Institute, they're, they're not only, you know, we know since 200 years there's cells, all organisms consist of one or more cells. And then we realized early on in the 19th century, well, their kidney cells are different from heart cells, they're different from corneal cells. Okay, and then, um, uh, you, you know, um, Raymond a compatriot of yours, Raymond Icaral, drew up the, you know, the, the, the dizzying variety of different morphologies. Well, now we know there are not just 10 or 20 types of neurons, there are 5,000 of them. Okay, so you take a brain that has roughly 100 billion, you know, 10 to the 11 different components of roughly 10 to the four different types with vast connectivity where each neuron talks to, you know, 50,000, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 other neurons. There's nothing like anywhere else in physics or at least in any other system that we have encountered that's even remotely as complex as that. There seems to be always like a, an epsilon of magic dust missing to be able to say what that complexity of that organization. And I say it metaphorically, of course, and I know IIT tries really hard to be very specific about what that is. Could you say more about it? Yeah, so IAT is very specific. It may be wrong, but it's very specific. In fact, there's code. You can download, there's Python code. You can download that for any particular network, whether these are neurons wired together or transistors wired together or anything else. Assuming you have a system, assuming you have a complete transition probability matrix, so you know, you know, if you... If this neuron or this transistor switches, what is the effect on all the other transistors or neurons? If you have a complete description of such a such a system, IAT will derive sort of what you can sort of think of the irreducibility of the system or the complexity of the system is known by the Greek number phi. It's a number, it's a pure number. It could be zero. Then the system, strictly speaking, doesn't exist as a whole, but it's more can be better described as independent, two or more independent system. And the larger the num this number phi, the more the, the the more the the more the system is irreducible. And within the theory, phi is also measure of the quantity in that particular state of the quantity of consciousness the system is experiencing in that particular state. And you can compute it. It has something to do with the causal power of the individual components, and it's 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 vast. So it, 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 the technical expression is that that IIT looks at a system, the transition probability matrix, and looks at all of the distinct causal powers. And the causal powers are just specified as if these two neurons are on, what's the effect on the rest of the system? And if these two neurons are, are now turning off, what's the effect on the system? If those ten neurons firing simultaneously what's the effect on on the rest of the system and you look at all possible combination 
of all possible sets of these elements, these switches, whether they're neurons or transistors or whatever. And from that, you derive a, a form, the, sort of the causal structure of the system in this particular state. And the theory says, this is what your conscious experience is. It's one-to-one, -one, every aspect of that conscious experience, including the painfulness of pain, the spatial extendedness of, you know, visual space I see around here, all of that it sort of can be mapped one to one onto the structure with nothing left over. So it's an identity relation. Yes. And there's something quite profound here. And I would like to also have your thoughts on it because at least you and I share the training as physicists and, and the shaping of our minds to understand abstract mathematics and also even the idea or the ideology of a theory of everything. By the way, most theories of everything in physics don't account, don't even try to account for experience. And at no. the same time, I think you and I and most of our audience here has a, a deep appreciation for phenomenology, going back to experience within experience, taking it really seriously, not a second class. Now, how do you reconcile? I mean, I, I struggle with it. It's not really, it's not a rhetorical question at all. The that that the, there can be a kind of this mathematical structure, or at least this structure that's that one can grasp mathematically, and that this that this is identical to the very felt presence where, by the way, from where the, the, an under, a mathematical understanding also emerges as an experience, right? So it's like a tail that's eating its own head and, and the other way around. Well, it's not quite an Ouroboros, as you suggest. Um, yes, it's non-trivial, A, eh? because the mathematics scale really steeply. You know, the scale is two to the two to the n. So, you know, even a system that only has 10 components in principle, if you look at all possible relationships, it's two to the two to the 10, which is two to the thousand, you know, which is, you know, vastly bigger than all the, the, the atoms in the, in the universe. Um, so this why, I mean, the, the mathematical calculus is complicated, it's well specified, but it's complex as is quantum mechanics, right? If you... If you're first exposed in undergrad 101 to quantum mechanics, it's non-trivial. In principle, it's well specified for any molecule. In practice, you can't really compute things, you know, beyond beyond very simple molecules. Uh, so that that's sort of an epistemic limitation, but it's not a princ uh, it's not a principle one. So ultimately, the theory has to be tested on its predictions. Does it make predict? It starts with consciousness, right, and it makes interesting prediction about its substrate. Uh, who, uh, what are the what is a substrate in the brain? Can you test it? And is it in agreement with with um, IIT? It makes a number of controversial predictions. For instance, it says in agreement with panpsychist intuition that consciousness may be much more widespread. In fact, the single cell, you know, if you look at a single molecule, um, uh, a single let's say paramecium that has contains already maybe a billion different molecules of a thousand different types, right? Um, it, there's already vast complexity there that no computers ever simulated. Maybe even that feels an itsy bitsy like something. It makes other predictions, for instance, that a quiet brain, a brain that is not firing, but that could fire, could be highly conscious. It makes another contra, in, uh, very counterintuitive prediction that the same brain that doesn't fire, but it doesn't fire because all the neurons have been turned off due to, because you inject anesthetic, let's say lidocaine, into this brain. So in both, in one case, you have a brain that could fire but doesn't fire, let's say because it's in a state of of deep meditation called pure presence, where well, it could fire but it doesn't fire. In the other case, you have a brain that has been injected with a paralyzing with a sort of lidocaine that blocks all the sodium channels. So this brain cannot fire. They both superficially look the same. None of the neurons are firing. Yet IAT says. The one brain here that could fire but doesn't is highly conscious, while the neuron over here, the brain that can't fire because you've just inactivated its causal st uh, structure, is not conscious at all. But these are all things that can be tested. Yes, I always found, found that particular aspect of integrated information theory fascinating because, as, as some of you know, I, I had a near-death experience, and I was wondering after it, and I don't think, by the way, that my brain was shut off, but in some cases, it seems like the organ of consciousness is pretty off. And yet people have very intense, incredible, and even consistent and meaningful experiences. And to my knowledge, IIT is the only theory that would 
give some credence to that. And for all the rest, and certainly for physicalist approaches, that would be quite the opposite. Like the, the, if the machine is broken, you get like poor poor performance, not that. So what's, what's your take on that? And you mentioned also pure presence. What's your take on, on what I call the edges of consciousness, those aspects that are there, but not so well studied? Well, okay, so I just uh, visited Lim van Lommel, the uh, Dutch cardiologist who published this uh, famous paper 2001 in Lancet, where, where he talks about his near-death um, experience study, where they did a longitudinal studies in uh, Dutch cardiology patients uh, who suffered cardiac arrest in hospital. And a significant fraction of them, 20% uh, or so, had these near-death experiences. And the wonder of it, these are all positive experiences. You know, you would think that when you die, you you know, you can't breathe, you faint very quickly, you have all these people screaming red code and all of that, that this would, would be a traumatic experience. But people typically experience, you know, it is very meaningful. Many people lose the fear of death and lose their anxiety. So that's very difficult to understand. However, there are a few challenges also. So you have to imagine you have a near-death experience and then Typically, you are, of course, then heavily sedated because people inject, you know, the doctors inj inject you with all sorts of substances. And you wake up, let's say, four hours later, and now you recount your experience. How do you know the experience was actually, you know, as it went? What's the relationship between the timing of that internal experience to clock time, to external clock time? Did it really occur when your EG supposedly was flat, or did it occur just before? Or did it occur just afterwards as the brain really booted up? That's very difficult to ascertain. The other thing to as difficult to ascertain, uh, an isoelectric EG does not mean there's no electrical activity. It means there's no large-scale synchronized activity in cortex. There may well be localized activity in cortex, and there may well be subcortical. We know this from animal experiments where you can still, let's say, get hippocampal activity, yet it doesn't show up necessarily as, you know, as a large, the, the typical large amplitude um, EG activity. So it's not easy to, ascert to ascertain. It would indeed be a challenge if the brain is truly inactivated by uh, hypoxia or anoxia in the extreme case, right? Your heart stands still, eight, seven to 10 seconds later, you faint. And then, of course, if the heart doesn't deliver oxygen to, to the brain anymore, it very quickly goes first uh, uh, hypoxic and then anoxic. If the brain is truly anoxic, you wouldn't get electrical activity. And it's difficult, and certainly also under IIT, to understand why such a brain that's completely deprived of oxygen could, could generate because you've just uh, totally inactivated all the causal processes. This is different from hypoxia or from a state of, of, of what, uh, you know, what Buddhist meditator calls pure presence, where, when your content is minimal, you know, people, there's no thoughts, there's no perception, it's just maybe this broad luminosity. And then you look at the EG, high-density EG, Melanie Bully in Madison in particular has done this experiment, when you see really a nadia inactivity, a lull inactivity, and this may correspond to a brain that's still active. In other words, it's not hypoxic, uh, but it has very little activity, yet it is, it is highly conscious. You're in the state of, of pure presence. The challenge of if near-death experiences are really true, if it's really true that a totally electrically inert brain can generate conscious experience, that would really be a big challenge for any brain-based theory of consciousness i love that how you put really, it actually that would really require some sort of idealist position that you know you this this inactivated brain can now activate you know can now somehow access mm -hmm. mind at large but you see I, I love how you put it because you're not saying that's impossible you're saying if that happens to be the case and it's really hard to empirically demonstrate like as we love like saying this is an empirical question well it's very difficult like the, the recent work of, of Sam Parnia, uh, aware of those, I mean, they, they went to fish yes. that and thousands, and then you get less because of those who have cardiac arrest and those who are, um, can tell the story. And then they found, in the end, they didn't find anybody. So it's really hard to fish. But if it was true, then we would need to rethink our theories rather than perhaps the other way around saying, well, because of our theories say that it cannot be true. But that's, that's, that's good to hear from your side, of course. That's correct. Yes. 
Now, we've mentioned near-death experiences, deep state, meditation. What about psychedelics, which of course have had this renaissance after being shut down, a little bit like maybe we can say consciousness studies were shut down, put on hold, well, and no, now they're in one coming case, back. In one case, you go to prison. <laughs> well, yeah. In other case, you're you're fired and you don't have a job. No, it's not you're the not same fired. Thing, but... Your people just look at you. Oh, you're gone, woo woo. Yes, yes. Well, it's another kind. It's different degree. I agree. Maybe different in kind. But my question is, what do you think these studies can offer? I mean, they can offer many things apart from great um, economic incentives and so on. But in terms of understanding consciousness, what goes on when? I mean, I've had it myself, and some people have, when you're on, on one of those trips, and they're not just fireworks, in my opinion, and it's still pretty mysterious that some molecules can produce that in one's mind, not to say one's brain. So I think if you're interested in consciousness, there are two reasons to, well, in general, there are three reasons to study psychedelic. A, the obvious one, why many people are doing it today, because it seems to help people with, generalized anxiety disorders with depression, treatment resistant depression, etc. It seems to help them. We don't understand why it does that. So you need to study that for the therapeutic efficiency. One number one. But for consciousness researcher, there are two reasons. One is they they can profoundly affect your conscious experience, which is why people do trip, right, on magic mushroom or ayahuasca. Right? You access these other domains. You can meet God and the devil and everything in between. You can see the galaxy, you can travel through space time, you can visit, every, you can you can have experiences of every possible human civilization. Um, and, and, and so the question is, if they so rapidly change your consciousness, what are the mechanisms, right? So you can now stick people in the magnet or put electrodes in them or give it to animals and record their brain waves, et cetera, et cetera. So you can study um, as a tool to discover the neural qualities of consciousness. But the, the reason I find them so fascinating is because they might reveal something about the ontology, about ontology, that maybe it is possible in these special states that these that the medicines together with the ceremonial, I'm thinking, for example, of ayahuasca ceremonies, that that these can put you, can put your brain into a state that tells you something about what truly exists. Yes, indeed. And that, you know, this goes back to, um, you know, Huxley's, if you read um, The Doors of Perception, right? He talks that under his experience here, just a couple of miles away from Caltech, where I'm right now in, in, in the canyons in LA, he encountered mind at large, right? When you feel you access something a way, you know, way bigger than you, you're like this tiny ant and you've accessed something vast, you know, that is very difficult to speak about. Does that tell us something about what truly exists? Yes. Or is it just, is it just your brain on drugs? Yes. Well, when you go back to the lab and you, you look at the scan, the way of thinking about it is just your brain on drugs. But I guess while you're on it, there's something maybe transcendent is too much to say, but there's something maybe sacred oh, no, about it. There's something thing transcendent. There's that borders something the transcendent. sacred about it, don't you think? I mean, oh, yes. how to how to square it with 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 science as we are told science is? How to square that a scientist is studying that, and at the same time has this experience of transcendence or the sacred? Well, as I said, you might be access realms that are normally not accessible. You can certainly experience the divine. You can have mystical experience where you feel you're one with the universe. Um, you can have near-death experiences. Uh, and all, all of these are by definition extraordinary. They're different from ordinary experience, like you know me drinking this cappuccino. And yeah, they certainly feel divine. You certainly feel like you have, that you are in the presence of something awe-inspiring. And you take this back into your into your regular into your regular life. Um. Yes. Let me zoom out now and, and say something. You know, I've written uh, about you in a piece. I, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, uh, just hold on. The this really reminds me of Schopenhauer. The experience now, Schopenhauer. You know, is the first version of his uh, his most famous work. 
or it's mainly his only work, the world as well in representation was written like in the 1820s, never took, there were any drugs available, etc. You know, he has this beautiful uh, quote when he talks about these experiences where the knower and the knowing, the apprehender and the apprehended becomes one. You know, the person who's involved in this perception is yes. no longer an individual, he says. For in such a perception, the individual has lost himself. He's pure willless, painless, timeless subject of knowledge. And that's certainly the experience you can have on, on uh, some of these substances. Yes, indeed. And too often, saying something like that immediately qualifies as woo-woo, but Schopenhauer can write about it or we can discuss about it maybe from a neuroscientific point of view, and it's perfectly, it's perf perfectly addressable um, and important, not just a curiosity. Well, and we, we can also cite William James, um, uh, William James, you know, the father of American psychology, when in his book on the varieties of religious experiences, he very explicitly, he says, people bring back this on this ontic knowledge, right? they bring back something that they find ineffable to explain to other people. Now, other he says very explicitly, other people, of course, don't have this experience, so therefore don't have to accept it. But for the person, the experience of the self, it can be a, a life-changing, a transformative experience. Yes, yes, and it is, yes. Well, since you mentioned William James, something comes to mind and I'd like to, to share with you to, to, to see what you think. So James make, made this distinction about the function of the brain as being productive versus permissive. In his case, he wrote of thought, but you could say of perception, of memory, of consciousness, and all the rest, attention, and so on. As I understand, at least under the view of IIT, the brain is not really producing consciousness as, as you know, as, as a heat engine is producing smoke or as a lamp is producing the genie when you rub it, but it isn't permitting it either. So what's your meta metaphor to think about what the brain is doing, a la James? It's a substrate. Without substrate, there wouldn't be any consciousness. You know, uh, I... Spontaneously, when I had a, a discussion with His Holiness the Dalai Lama about reincarnation, I said, well, Your Holiness, four words. No brain, never mind. More general put in IT, without a substrate, there has to be some sort of substrate. Now, it may be very weird and, you know, quantum mechanical mm. or strains in space-time, but there has to be some sort of substrate. Without substrate, yes. uh, it's difficult to imagine certainly IT without a substrate, you know, in the absence of anything, you're not going to get a consciousness. So there needs yes. to be ultimately some sort of substrate, but it's different from, you know, there's an engine and the engine burns something. And, you know, the steam that comes out of the steam engine, it's not, it's, it's not like that because what, what, well, in the ontology of IT, what really exists is only what exists for itself, which is consciousness. Right now we, we all exist for ourselves. Tonight, we're going to go sooner than later, depending where we are on the planet's face, we'll go to sleep. And then in deep sleep, particularly early on during sleep, you don't exist for yourself anymore. You're simply not there. You're in deep sleep. You're gone. Same way you're gone during anesthesia. Now, your body and your brain are still there for someone else observing you, but you are not there for yourself anymore. And consciousness is the only thing that exists for itself. Everything else is secondary. The substrate doesn't exist for itself. Because the substrate doesn't know about itself, the substrate exists for others, and and so absolute existence is is only consciousness has this absolute measure of existence. Everything else is relative existence for others. I think this is big news and big progress. Leaving yes. aside <laughs> leaving, leaving aside cool new techniques and imaging and so on, what you just said, I think it's great great progress in consciousness studies. Yes, but this is not universally accepted, of course. Well, yes, yes, of course. Which brings me back to the 90s and 30 years ago and 30 years back. And I wanted to ask you, um, and as you know, I, I wrote in a piece, a paragraph that was honestly praising you for, for being, and I can use the, the word notorious again, in, 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 of course, in a positive sense, one of the most well-known scientists who has changed their mind. And, and this is so rare. So I wanted, this maybe moves us into another discussion, more epistemic or sociological, how remarkable and how difficult it is, not only to say, well, if I'm wrong, I'll accept it, that we say in theory, or even ad admit 
provisional defeat, as you were saying, with, with David Chalmers and the bet, whatever. But to say, well, I started here, I was really committed to this, and then I moved into this romantic, romantic reductionist, and now I may even entertain panpsychism. And if a normal person does it, that's great. But let me say, with all honesty again, if, if somebody like you do it over the last 30 years, it's super remarkable. What's How do you change your mind? Why is it so hard? People fall too much in love with their own ideas. It has to do with love of self, ultimately. You know, you work 30, and it's understandable, right? You work 30 years on something, and you believe it's to be true, and you put all your time and energy, you burn the midnight oil, and you write painful grants to get it funded and all of that. And then there's a piece of data or several pieces of data that contradict you. And so it's just human nature to say, well, I'm not going to believe that and I'm going to invent. And of course, the smarter people are, the better they're at inventing reasons why they don't need to take that particular piece of data seriously. There's this famous Bon Moore from Max Planck, you know, the one of the founders of quantum theory, who says science progresses one funeral at a time. And that's what he means, right? People themselves will go to their grave believing my theory is right. But then, of course, what happens is that they don't attract as much funding, they don't attract attention, they don't attract new grad students because the data looks more, their theory looks more and more challenged by all the data. And then the theory uh, sort of quietly, um, quietly dies. But if you, if you try not to be too attached to yourself and to your own uh, ideas, you know, I had an idea, well, it was interesting at the time, I got it published, but, you know, it wasn't right. So... I, I personally never found it uh, very difficult to say, okay, I was wrong. You know, I did my best. It's like in climbing, you know, I, I used to climb big walls. You know, you do your best. Very often there are other people, usually there are other people who are always better than you, but you did your best and you failed and that's okay. Yes, yes. And yet it seems to me that science needs more oil so that it can do it. And at the beginning of yes. this conversation, you mentioned, well, in the 90s, well, once you got tenure, Perhaps you could do whatever you want and study consciousness. But I know from experience, personal and my colleagues, that you think you'll get tenure and you'll do whatever you want and, and you don't. And then you think you'll get professorship or head of department or head of institute or even Nobel Prize. And most people don't. And Francis Crick was an exception in that sense. So what's what do you think is happening psychologically and, and how to, well, you just described it, right? This attachment or la lack of attachment, how to to promote this kind of creativity and flexibility and curiosity as opposed to just stifle it? Well, so A, we inter to your first point, we internalize what the, you know, what people around us we believe, right? This is what our brain, you know, yes, I want to study conscious, now I have tenure, so I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not going to lose tenure, but people still are very skeptical. They roll their eyes, or grad students always attuned to the mores of the elders, you know, you see conscience and they begin to roll their eyes. And so after a while, you don't do that anymore because people, are, you know, you don't, you, you want to do something where people are excited about. But then, of course, if you're still driven by it, so, and what I always try to do, I try to, I'm, I'm not a human being that also happens to be a scientist. I'm a human being and a scientist at the same time. And so my, the concerns I have as a human, namely where does my, the feeling in my head come from, informs my science and, you know, I want to understand, uh, you know, before I die, the, the nature of these feelings, right, and, and 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 what exists. And so for me, I've always been obsessed with that, by better words. What helps really is to develop selflessness. And you can do that, you know, we, we all live on planet ego. Our entire life, certainly as adults, we live in the gravitational field of the self. We always... Implicitly or explicitly, it's about me, me, me. I, when I meet someone, I always think, well, how does it relate to me and my my short, medium, or long-term interests? Always, it's it's what it's what we do. But there are occasions when, in love, for instance, or in in um, uh, certain states of flow, like when you run or code or do mathematics or climb or whatever, you can you can you can lose that self. Right? It's a very beautiful state, and particularly during psychedelics or during meditation and during psychedelics, you can profoundly lose a sense of self. And then you realize the world is beautiful and the self can often get in the way of things. What it's about young students? To cultivate, to cultivate selflessness. What Same about young, young students? students? Yes. How do how do we do to have a to nurture a field where where this can happen not too painfully? 
believe in yourself and try to cultivate some, some, you know, you have to believe in yourself and persevere in, in, um, uh, in what you believe. Yes. Let me ask you about big science because you've been head of the Allen Institute and that's also relevant a relevant aspect of science as we know it and as we practice it. On the one hand, let's make a gradient here maybe, you have people that can work on a theory in isolation for decades and, and then have people work around. And, and Giulio Tononi could be a good example, right? He, he created that thing alone for many, many years and then shared it with the world and so on. That could be one example. On the other hand, we have teams like the one you, you, you've you led, right? Like of hundreds, if not thousands of people. So you've seen both sides of this spectrum. What are their respective roles today? And and I suppose you, you think we need them both. Yeah, you need them both. You know, if you look at, it's just like in physics, it's a one or F distribution, right? The large number, the vast majority of researchers, let's say in physics, you know, it's a professor and a postdoc and a grad student, right? But then you have a few very large teams like CERN or Argo National Lab, Stanford Linear Center, Accelerator, DAISY. You've got these massive astronomy projects. So it takes all a science, you know, a science of mature science. A sign of mature science is these highly developed ecosystems where you have large labs, big science that do certain things. Well, you need big science. In other words, where you need highly reproducible science, you need large teams that consistently apply the same technique over and over again. So you get these databases that that you know that are very reliable that no one else can do but you also need individual researchers who have a crazy idea what everyone else is crazy and pushes it forward and then you know shows that this idea is actually true and 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 we are a society we're certainly large and rich enough to be able to fund all these different size lab and now of course in a particular neuroscience now we also have industry right it's a very, it's a new component over the last 10 or 20 years you've got black rocks you've got Neuralink, you've got pharma now you've got you know the renaissance and psychedelics so you have all these startups operating in this space but it's a very exciting time to be uh, to be a neuroscientist and to study in particular to study consciousness yes indeed now what do you see, and with this, we'll, we'll start wrapping up and then open it up for Q&A. Yeah, Alex, I, I, I'm afraid I have to switch here. I have to look for power. All right. <laughs> I like the live aspect of this. Great. No problem. <laughs> Your Mac will sleep soon unless I, I, so I may have to switch to my phone. Okay. Good. Let me try to dial on, to dial in while, uh, while, while we talk. So you're going to see another invite from me, okay? Yeah, another perspective. That's good. <laughs> Yes, no problem. Um, okay, I'm now dialing in on my phone. If, if, it, if it dies, it will be a glorious way to end the conversation, so worry about it. Ah, maybe in, in the meantime, maybe, oh, you're here. I'll yeah, admit <laughs> you're back. Maybe we can spotlight the other Christoph Koch in case, or maybe, all right. So what, two more, two more questions, maybe Christoph, if you may, one is, um, speaking about mature sciences, big science, if you had to age the, the science of consciousness along a lot, comparing it to a lifespan of a person, is it a toddler? Is it a teenager, angry teenager. and trying all different teenager, right? I knew, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I knew you'd say that. It's teenager, right? Like tattooing, yes. piercing, protesting, yes. angry, fighting. Yes. All right. <laughs> yes, yes. I like that. Yes. How exciting is this? Do you do you feel it's time we move to a more mature or that just takes whatever it takes? I mean, what's needed to move to the next phase? Are we close to that? It's difficult to say ahead of time. You know, most Importantly, progress in, in the science of consciousness agreement on convergence towards some understanding of what are the bits and pieces of the brain that are really critical. Is quantum mechanics critical or not? Things like that. Uh, that would be the, in the biggest uh, sort of empirical progress. Because otherwise, in 100 years and 1,000 years, we'll still be arguing about the metaphysical points. Hmm. 
now 30 years back and now 30 years in the future and that could be another bet i mean guessing where do you think we will be in another 30 years 25 years 25. well all i can say this point will be closer hopefully <laughs> We will be, the biggest challenge is we'll be in the presence of super intelligent machines. And of course, those super intelligence machines, we see it already today with LLMs, will convince us that they are conscious because they talk like us. In fact, they talk, they have more poise, better memory, more intelligent than us. So to many people, they'll be totally convincing that they're conscious because, you know, we, we, are, we grew up and we evolved in an environment where we infer consciousness and other people by asking them, how are you? How do you feel today? Right? What that means, I'm directly, I'm querying you about your states of consciousness. And if you can do that with LLMs, you know, then you accept implicitly while well, they're conscious, although in reality, they're just faking it. So I think that will be one of the biggest challenges for us, for, for humanity as a whole to address. I guess for that, we need theories too, right? Because some, only because one thing looks like, appears only to be theories. like us. Yes, That's entirely correct. Only theory, only a properly formulated theories can tell us are they really conscious or are they just faking it? Now, a last comment here, and I know you're an, a lover of animals, as we should all be, but isn't it isn't it ironic that well, maybe some people may may attribute more animacy, agency, consciousness to an algorithm than to a dog or or to a cat? Yeah, because they don't talk. Right. So as I said, we are all we are verbal creatures, we are speaking apes through and through. And we infer consciousness because we ask other people and they seem to be conscious. Although babies, of course, don't talk. And uh, if you have an aged relative and he or she had a stroke, you know, they are phasic, but you still assume consciousness. So it, it they're just very seductive, these LLMs, because they are so clever, because they are so intelligent, uh, that we infer consciousness. Although I agree, they are less conscious than a bug. They're less conscious than a fly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, really, last one, Christoph. You may be involved in so many projects right now. Right now, what's what's one of them that's that's really that's really exciting and new that you would want to share? Something that that it's right now particularly occupying your mind. Well, we're trying to test um, some quantum mechanical. You know, to what extent is there's some interesting isotope effects in neurobiology, uh, which are difficult to explain using conventional chemistry. And uh, no, I can't plug it. And um, find a power outlet. And um, you know, trying to test such theories. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's really interesting. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you, Alex. And thank you all for joining us here at the Paris Center. And we look forward to seeing you at our next session. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.